All right, so my name is uh, Dustin Johnson, and as uh, David said, with my wife Sarah Johnson, and I just want to thank David and all the saints here for having us here. We count it as a privilege, always a privilege to teach God's Word. And I also just want to thank uh, my father-in-law, uh, Kevin, Kevin Mutford, who lives in New Zealand, because he sent us a video of David, and uh, that's kind of how we found you guys. So, privilege to be here. Um, my wife and I, we've been married for about a year and a half now. So she had this quote whenever she was single, and she said, Run after the Lord as fast as you can, and if someone is able to keep up, then introduce yourself. <laughs> so we've been, we're running for the Lord, uh, towards the Lord together and uh, having a good time doing it. Uh, so what we want to do this morning is, I want to just give a brief uh, uh, testimony of my salvation. That way you guys know I'm not a heretic. And uh, then we want to talk a little bit about the blood of Christ and the Word of God. So let's go ahead and bow our heads in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that you wrote and preserved it through history and time. And we just pray as we come to it now that you can enlighten our hearts. Through Christ we pray. Amen. So, I, like I said, I was, I was saved at the age of 15. And uh, sadly, I thought I got saved at the age of 7. So from the age of 7 to 15, I was actually lost thinking I'm saved. And see, that's a sad, that's really a sad story because how many people out there is in the same boat? They go to church, they do, good, they do good works, but yet they're lost because they don't know Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. As a 7-year-old boy, all I remember doing was asking my mom to come into the room and we said a prayer and we asked God into my heart, asked for forgiveness, you know, the typical professing Christian thing to do. Prayer, ask God into your heart, ask for forgiveness. But folks, that won't save you. The only thing that will save you is uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and when He shed His blood and your faith resting in that alone. You got Romans 4. Let's take a look at verse number 4. Romans 4.4. 4. He says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now those are the two verses that a Bible teacher was explaining to me, and I realized at the age of 15 that what I had done before was wrong. And this is it. It's only when Christ looks at your faith and when it's resting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that He died for you and rose to be your Savior. It's only when faith is resting in that alone where God counts you for righteousness. But prayer, as I mentioned, it won't save you. Colossians 4.12 uh, identifies prayer as a labor. And see, the problem with that is Ephesians 2.8 says that for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if prayer is a labor, Colossians 4.12, and yet we're not saved based off works, prayer won't save you. And asking God into your heart won't save you neither, because Jeremiah 17 says that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Why would God want to move into something... <sighs> A garbage hole like that, right? First He saves you, and then you become the temple, the dwelling place of God the Holy Spirit. And asking for forgiveness. Does God grant you forgiveness because we asked for it, or because He bled and died on a cross and rose from the dead? You see, again, Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. There's nothing we can say, do, or ask in which God's going to grant us forgiveness. It's only based upon the blood of Christ. And so again, back in Romans 4.4, 4, these are the two verses that changed my life. Verse 4, he says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. I've always thought it was interesting, that verse, how he compares working for God's grace to debt. You see that? If you know anything about debt, or at least how it makes people feel, you know, you know how it is. The bill comes in once a month. You pay it off. It's just going to be here the next month. And you feel like you'll never pay it off. You'll never get there. That's the way working for salvation will make you feel. I had a lady tell me one time, Well, I just don't feel like I've done enough for the Lord. And we had to sit there and tell her that there's nothing you do will ever be good enough. Because nothing you do will be as perfect 
is what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that alone. And so verse number 5, he says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Now who is that? If you jump over to chapter 5, verse number 6. Chapter 5, verse 6, he says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So that's the hymn in verse 4. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so like I said, those two verses completely changed my life. And um, I got that at the age of 15. My wife, on the other hand, was saved at 5. <laughs> so I joke that she's about 10 years ahead of me. <laughs> no. uh, but alright, so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about the blood of Christ. Um, that's not a very popular uh, subject, but it's a very necessary topic. So if you will, follow me to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, I'm sure you guys are um, well aware that this is where Paul gives the gospel. Verse 1 he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. And if you go to Acts 20, 24, he identifies that as the gospel of the grace of God. So in verse 3 and 4, he um, identifies that as uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I just want you to notice verse 3 for a second. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. You see how he says how that Christ died for our sins? That's a good question. How is it that Christ died for our sins? Was He strangled? Did, would He just pass out? I mean, how did He really die for our sins? Come to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 22. Hebrews 9.22, he says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And he's talking about the remission of sins. So without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And that's exactly how Christ died for our sins. He bled. He shed His blood. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, that's God the Father, hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Well, that verse is telling us that Christ Jesus, or rather, God the Father has set forth Christ Jesus to be a propitiation. That word just means a satisfaction. But how? Through faith in His blood. Someone might say, well, I thought it was the, the faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. Yes, but how did He die? Shed His blood. Look at Romans 5.9. Romans 5.9. He says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now that reminds me, in verse number 1 of Romans 5, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When he says we have peace with God, that is, what you, that is a present possession that you have in Christ. And whenever you sin, God doesn't snatch that peace away from you and say, Well, I'll give you some peace next week when you straighten up. That's not the way it works. Folks, you're eternally secure. Romans 6.23, he says, uh, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You see, if I was to give you a free gift, let's say a Bible. I give you a Bible. I say, here, this is a free gift. It's yours. You go home, you put it on the bookshelf, and then you do something to offend me. If I was to break into your house and snatch that Bible from you, that makes me a thief and a liar, doesn't it? 
You see, Christ gave us eternal life as a free gift. So if you offend Him and He snatches that away, uh, away from you, that, it wasn't a free gift in the first place, was it? So folks, you are eternally secure when you're in Christ. Uh, get two passages this time. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6.20. 1 Corinthians 6.20 and Acts 20.28. 20, 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 20, and Acts 20, verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20, he says, For ye, Paul is writing here, and he says, For ye, the body of Christ, are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. For you're bought with a price. Acts 20, 28 is going to tell us what the price was. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. Now my wife and I, we try to have date night at least once a week. And we went to this coffee shop nearby. And we walk in, I order our coffee and I couldn't find my credit card. <laughs> I couldn't make the purchase. But see, Christ is not like me. He doesn't come up short. He had the payment. And He had because He shed His blood. That was the payment. He paid the price. Now, I did find my credit card, so I didn't ruin date night. But uh, go to Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17. And verse number 11. Leviticus 17, 11. He says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now, you know you're back here in the Old Testament, so you know this is uh, back then they had the blood of bulls and goats as an atonement for their sins, but whenever Christ came and died on the cross, that was the complete and total payment there. His blood. Uh, but the part I want you to see in verse number 11 is the first part of that where he says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Life is in the blood. That's something that uh, Sarah, she was, when she lived in New Zealand, she was known as the blood girl. Because when she witnessed, she hammered home that point. And so when we got married, she was always, life is in the blood. And she's big on eating for your blood type. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, eating for your blood type. If you're a type A, there's certain foods that are good for you that may not be good for a type O. Um, we do that. And see, I, went, I had a kidney problem a while back and uh, went to the doctor three times, did three different tests, and the last visit they sat down, looked at me, and said, We don't know what's wrong. Thanks, doc. <laughs> so Sarah and I started talking, and she had me eating for my blood type and drinking lemon water, and within a week it was fixed. So it does work, and I think that's a biblical thing too, because if you have a health problem and life is in the blood, well, feed that, you know, feed that body the nutrients that it needs to fix itself, right? God, you know, God's creation is, is really fascinating. Uh, but point is that Christ gave His life on the cross by shedding that blood. Uh, I'm reminded, since we're here in Leviticus, let's go to Exodus 12. Exodus 12, 13. Exodus 12, is, that's uh, talking about the Passover lamb, the, uh, the death angel, and so forth. God told them that they need they have to strike the blood on the two side posts and the upper post, and if the blood is there, they'll pass over the children of Egypt. Uh, but we want to get uh, chapter twelve, verse thirteen, and he says, "And the blood shall be shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you." God says, "When I see the blood." I'll pass it. He doesn't care about your religion. He doesn't care about your good works, your background. When he sees the blood, that's what matters. For the New Testament, for members of the body of Christ today, it's the blood of Christ. Are you under the blood? 
Amen. All right, get two more passages with me. Get Colossians 1, 14 and 1 Corinthians 15. Colossians 1, 14 and 1 Corinthians 15. Colossians 1, verse number 14. We'll look at that one first. Colossians 1, 14, he says, In whom, talking about in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you compare that with 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 3, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. These two passages are interesting. In all of your modern Bibles, from 1881 to 2021, the modern Bibles are going to leave out in Colossians 1.14 where he says, His blood. So their text is going to read something like, In whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. And see, they leave out the blood. And that's a, that's a pretty big deal. If you, 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 3, you see the word how, they take that word out, how. So it's just going to say, Christ died for our sins, instead of how that Christ died for our sins. You might say, well, what's the big deal? It's just one word. Well, look at Matthew 27, verse number 4. Matthew 27, and verse number 4. Matthew 27, verse 4, uh, this is Judas speaking, and he says, Matthew 27, 4, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. But you see in verse 4 where he says, I have betrayed the innocent blood. These modern Bibles are going to uh, take out the word the innocent blood. The so their text is going to read something along the lines of, I have betrayed innocent blood. Well, look, anybody can shed innocent blood. I mean, I got two cats. If there was something to, to attack those two cats for no good reason, that's innocent blood, right? What's a cat compared to Christ? <laughs> the innocent blood. It was Christ, not just innocent blood. So they water it down. They water it down. And then in Colossians 1.14, they just straight deny it by taking out the blood. So these anemic Bibles are not trustworthy. Now we just looked at a few um, examples, but they leave out hundreds of verses. Hundreds. And these Bibles, like I said, are not trustworthy. They have Satan's influence on them. And uh, so I'll, we want to look at that now. Let's look a little bit at the Word of God. Turn with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. First Peter 1, verse number 23. And, uh, and I, I understand, uh, you know, First Peter is written to the little flock, the little remnant of Israel going through the, the tribulation. Um, but Paul says in Romans uh, 15 that for whatsoever written aforetime was for our learning. So we can learn things, you know, in, in these epistles here. And here's something that we learn. First Peter 1, verse 23. He says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, Peter says, being born again, uh, that's, you know, being born of the Spirit. Paul in Titus 3 talks about being, uh, being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Um, being born again, being born of the Spirit, not of corruptible seed. Now, the seed there is identified as the word of God. And he says, we're born again, not of a corrupt seed, but of what? Incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So as far as Peter concerned, he didn't get saved based off a corrupt word of God. Look at James 1.18. James chapter 1, in verse 18. 
James 1.18, he says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. See, Paul says, I've begotten you, I've begotten you through the gospel. Well, where's the gospel recorded at? In the word of God. Begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so what happens is Satan is a master counterfeiter. You can go through your whole Bible and see how Satan just counterfeits the Lord Jesus Christ. Just one example, Christ is going to come down on a white horse. Revelation 6, Satan has a, a white horse. Master counterfeiter. So what he does is he creates many, many counterfeit versions of the Bible. And I'm not talking about the Satan Bible. I'm talking about NIV, ESV, the New King James, modern Bibles, 1881 to 2021. Um, look at 2 Corinthians 2.17. Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse number 17. He says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So Paul says, there's going to be a corrupt word, but then there's Paul, Paul and him writing says that we speak in, the, in Christ. You've got God's pure words, and you've got corrupt word. The two different texts. So there are other Bibles that have been corrupted and they have Satan's fingerprints on them. Here's how we know. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter number 4. And Mark chapter number 4, uh, this is going to be the parable of the sower. And there's a lot of you know doctrinal issues that Christ is going over here in his earthly ministry. And we're not going to go through every every parable, but I want you to see one thing and pay close attention to the strategy of Satan and what he does. Let's start in Mark 4, verse number 1. Uh, and he, talking about Christ, began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea, uh, was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Now, if you write down uh, Matthew thirteen thirty seven, the sower there is identified as the Son of Man. All right, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse four, and it came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, if we drop down to verses 14 to 15, he identifies what he meant in that parable. So verse 14 of Mark 4, he says, The sower soweth the word. All right, so we got uh, the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's sowing, and he's sowing the word in the hearts of people. Verse 15, And these are they by the wayside. Where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So what does Satan do? He steals the word of God in their hearts. He's a thief. You see, when a thief comes into your house and breaks in your home, they look for the most precious and expensive thing to take, don't they? In Psalm 138, verse 2, God says, For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. The, the, God's word is very important to him. He, we have, you know the saying, a man is only as good as his word? Hey, if God's perfect, his book is perfect. Look at John 10.10. 10. John chapter 10, verse number 10. Again, talking about the thief, talking about Satan. John chapter 10, verse number 10. He says, The thief cometh not, but for to, notice, steal and to kill and to destroy. Those three things. Satan comes to steal. He wants to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, steal, kill, and destroy. 
That's his strategy there. Utter destruction. Is that the kind of influence of a person you want on your Bible? Not hardly. Notice what Christ says in, in the rest of that verse. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. See how Christ says, I am come that they might have life? We'll back up to John 6. John chapter 6 and verse number 63. John 6, 63. Christ is speaking and He says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, make alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. You see, God's word produces life. But Satan, on the other hand, still kill and destroy. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, the word of God goes through five attacks. You've got Satan, he questions it. Yea, hath God said. He flat out denies it by saying, Thou, thou shalt not surely die. And Eve, she adds subtraction, waters it down. We've seen those attacks so far in this study. You've got, they water it down by omitting how in 1 Corinthians 15 and omitting thee in uh, Matthew 27 and then flat out denying the, the blood in Colossians 1.14. See, that's what I'm saying about these modern Bibles have Satan's influence, his fingerprints on them. But Christ, on the other hand, I speak in the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word produces life, and we get eternal life by believing the gospel, and the gospel comes from this incorruptible seed, the word of God. A while back, Sarah and I were doing a lot of studying on the topic of hell uh, for our YouTube channel. We're just doing a lot of studying, a lot of reading, and the reality of hell just sat, sat in one morning. I was driving on my way to work, and just the reality of it just got me down. You know, I was like, man, it didn't necessarily doubt my salvation, but I was like, I need some reassurance on this. You know, I'm saved. And so I started thinking about the verses, and I was just uh, refreshed to know that it's not about me. It's not about what I did or what I do. It's about Christ and everything He did on the cross for me. And, and not only that, but I'm depending on the Word of God that it recorded the gospel down perfectly. <laughs> and so it's refreshing to know that we're not depending on um, a, a corrupt seed. We're depending on an infallible, incorruptible seed, the Word of God. So folks, thank you so much for your attention, and we'll go ahead and bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, again, that you have preserved it through history and time, and we thank you for the fruit that's came from it, and uh, just pray that our time of fellowship here uh, will be uh, fruitful, and just pray that everything glorifies you. Through Christ we pray.